Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Leon County Public Library Lecture Series. I am Pamela Monroe, the Library Director, and so happy to have you here tonight for what is sure to be an insightful lecture from Dr. Kendra Mitchell. For the past six years, the Library Lecture Series has featured talented expert speakers who engage and inspire the community with thoughtful discussions about topics in the arts and sciences. And Dr. Mitchell's lecture will be no different. During this evening's lecture, we will be taking a close look at Toni Morrison's Pulitzer Prize winning novel, Beloved. As a professor of English at FAMU, Dr. Mitchell's current research interests include exploring madness as cosplay in Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye and mapping geospatial, social, and multimodal circulation of Black identities and culture at the historically Black colleges and universities. Her award-winning publications can be found in the Writing Center Journal, Praxis Journal, and several book collections. Dr. Mitchell is an executive committee member for the National Council of Teachers of English and has served as a cultural ambassador to South Africa as a Fulbright English teaching assistant in 2016. Her commitment to serving Leon County can be seen in the 10 years she served as executive board for the Literacy Volunteers of Leon County, her service as a 2020 KCCI Catalyst, and her cultural literacies project for marginalized youth. The lecture tonight is part of the National Endowment for the Arts Big Read Program, which is happening now through the end of March at the Leon County Public Library. This year's NEA Big Read events focused on Beloved, and each event explores themes found in the book, including family relationships, memory, and the destructive legacy of slavery, and heroism. Now, please join me in welcoming my friend, Dr. Kendra Mitchell. <laughs> wow. You know, sometimes when you listen to people describe you or introduce you, you wonder, well, who is that person? <laughs> and this time is no different. Thank you, Ms. Moreau, for the lovely introduction, my friend and fellow scholar. Um, today, I have, have a charge to talk to you about what my ideas are in regards to creating beloved communities. But first, I want to kind of give you an introduction um, into what my thoughts are about why we need to have this conversation, maybe why the time now is right for it. And what can it mean, not just in a literary context, right? Because sometimes we can read a good book and we can say, oh, it won this award and it has all these accolades, but then it stays on the shelf or it stays in the library. It does not have any real community import. So I'm going to journey through the text in, intention, in the intention or with the intention to actually create some sense of how we can mobilize these ideas, um, and it's just, it's a project that I began in 2020, but now I'm expanding it to kind of go beyond the classroom. As you already know, I'm a professor. And so a lot of what I think about um, how I process has to do with what is happening in my classroom settings. And in those spaces, I have the unique opportunity to work with um, students who are a part of um, the ancestry of enslaved Africans, not only them, but a, a majority of them, right? And historically, how they are, they end up in those spaces, what their goals and motivations are, are always at the center of my conversations, the center of my research, the center of what I want to teach and how I want to teach. And so this opportunity allows me to share a little bit of that with you um, and how I do that. And so a lot of that has to do with a bit of call response, right? You know, um, so I won't necessarily be giving you a, a traditional lecture where you get to sit back and listen to all of the things that I spout off, but you will actually get a chance to give me some response, right? We can be co-creators as 
um, a, a scholar that I, I definitely admire, Beverly Moss, she talks about um, a community text and how it arises in the Black church. And she talks about how the, the audience in a, or the congregation aren't just passive listeners or receivers of the message, but they are indeed also co-creators. So I kind of want to think of you as my co-creators, okay? Is that all right? Amen. Amen, okay. <laughs> but we're not just sitting with one identity. So I also am thinking about you um, in the same ways, in the beloved ways as I think about my students, right? In all the complicated ways that functions. <laughs> Sometimes they come to the class ready, prepared, all right, read the text and ready to engage. Sometimes they're going to catch up, right? And they need um, a little moment for the professor to kind of give them some, some introduction or some background. And sometimes they have views that, that definitely differ than what um, I have or share, and that's all accepted and all valued. So I want you to kind of work with me. I'm Dr. K in those spaces. So if you can allow me to be Dr. K and you play the role of my students, that'd be great. And not in an insulting way, right? <laughs> but just in the way of some of our, our performativity, right? So in this constructive, fictive kinship that we are establishing, right? You know, um, we are creating our own community in this moment. And so those are some of the ways in which I want to foreground this conversation. And if we're in agreement, just say yes. Yes, amen. I'll take that too. I want you to pause you guys to stop sharing the slides on the web online. So allow me to just do that real quick. Okay. We understand technology at this point. It sometimes has a mind of its own. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Okay. All right. So uh, I'll leave you with this, or I start with this quote. Um, I want the reader to be kidnapped, thrown ruthlessly into an alien environment as the first step into a shared experience with the book's population, just as the characters were snatched from one place to another, from any place to any other, without preparation or defense. This is how Morrison thinks of her, um, her introduction and her um, and beloved. And honestly, I think that this is important for us to recognize and let this be a point of entry. Let me ask you, how many of you have already read Beloved? Okay, um, in the, the online community, you can just put a one in the chat if you have, a two if you haven't, okay? Okay, so that's the majority of our in-person um, audience. So that means that we have some familiarity with this quote. We understand, how many of you recognize and understand what she means when she's saying this? She wants to kidnap you. Yes. I'm so sorry. <laughs> just give me a second. And that should be exchange. Oh, there you are. That's the problem. There's three options, sorry. <laughs> Hey, you're doing better than I am, so <laughs> I don't know what to do. With it. Okay, so with this, this disruption, we know that the text starts off in the middle, in, in a pivotal time in history, right? 1873. And in this time, you're, you're coming into how this, um, this period in time and reconstruction, early reconstruction era in the US, how it's actually jarring not just the nation right it's not just looked at as a, a moment in history where this is something positive and the the, the country is on the the rise we see something else happening a contrast in scenes right we see this what's supposed to, or what has been purported as is solely positive turn in our country's history to an interior perspective of how a particular family, a particular community is processing it, yes? And that, that jarring, that juxtaposition of those worlds looks like you have no control over what is happening. You don't have a strong sense of time. You don't know who's who, what's happened, is the baby alive or not? What is, what is it to be haunted, right? But a lot of these concepts and these, um, the concepts of memory and loss and pain and hurt and even despair are continual tropes in this novel for this very reason. Morrison is trying to awaken our country to recognize something that it has been, I would say, deliberately silent about. Yes. And the more things change, the more they stay the same. Yes. We can find moments 
in our current times that will look a lot like 1873 in this moment. Okay, so we'll be thinking about that and under and processing what that might look like. Um, I also wanted to share with you some other words from Morrison because I think it's important to read her forward. If you have the cop, let me turn around. If you have the cop, this copy, right? Um, the copy that the library gave away, you have this introduction from Morrison that gives you the context. And there is a part I want to read in particular, but just to give you a summary, what is happening in this forward is that Morrison is telling us how she got to Beloved, right? So she tells us that it was a transitional part, our time in her professional work as an editor. Um, how many of us knew that she was an editor at Random House for, okay. All right, maybe a few people, maybe fewer people, but that's okay. If you read the forward, you will find out a little bit about that context. And there are other works that will <laughs> uh, help her, uh, help you all identify that as well. But she gives you some background that her, um, her time, this is a time when her time in, as an editor is expiring, okay? So she's wrapping up this time because she has been writing um, a lot. She has been writing, has four novels at this point. And she tells you um, what ends up happening is that she, dis she decides to create the Black book, okay? And this Black book, this this archival um, project that she does where she collects all these um, artifacts from Black culture and Black in the US over a period of time, she captures that and she runs into a particular artifact that becomes the impetus for, or the impetus for this text, Beloved, okay? So I wanted to read a little bit about this, okay. A few days after my last day at work, sitting in front of my house on the pier, jutting out into the Hudson River, I began to feel an edginess instead of the calm I had expected. I ran through my index of problem areas and found nothing new or pressing. I couldn't fathom what was so unexpectedly troubling on a day that perfect, watching a river that serene. I had no agenda and couldn't hear the telephone if it rang. I heard my heart, though, stumping away in my chest like a colt. I went back to the house to examine this apprehension, even panic. I knew what fear felt like. This was different. Then it slapped me. I was happy, free, in a way I had never been, ever. It was the oddest sensation, not ecstasy, not satisfaction, not a surfeit of pleasure or accomplishment. It was a pure delight, a rogue anticipation with certainty. Enter beloved. Okay. Um, and so in this part, she's talking about that freedom where she's making her decision to write full time. Okay. And so then she says, the idea was riveting. Um, the idea was riveting, but the canvas overwhelmed me, summoning characters who would or who could manifest the intellect and the ferocity, such logic would provoke proved beyond my imagination until I remembered one of the books I had published back when I had a job. A newspaper clipping in the Black book summarized the story of Margaret Garner, a young mother who, having escaped slavery, was arrested for killing one of her children and trying to kill the others. Rather than let them be returned to the owner's plantation, she, be, she became a, a cause celebre in the fight against the fugitive slave laws, which mandated the return of escapees to their owners. Her sanity and lack of repentance caught the attention of abolitionists as well as newspapers. She was certainly single-minded and judging by her comments, she had the intellect, the ferocity and the willingness to risk everything for what was to her the necessity of freedom. Okay. And so she goes on to talk about um, her, this quote much later and what she wants to do. It was important to name this house, but not the way Sweet Home or the plantations were named. Um, there would be no adjectives suggesting coziness or grandeur or the laying claim to an instant aristoc aristocratic past. Only numbers here to identify the house while simultaneously separating it from a street or city, marking its difference from the houses of other Blacks in the neighborhood, allowing it, 
it a hint of the superiority, the pride former slaves would take in having an address of their own, yet a house that has literally a personality, which we call haunted when that personality is blatant. Okay, so here we get a sense of how Morrison sets the tone of Beloved and how her thinking behind why it was significant to start off with 124, right? The 124 Bluestone Road is significant for a number of reasons. And she outlines that. And it's important for us to understand that that juxtaposition with what that house is feeling, the personality of the house, it kidnaps the reader. It snatches us into another space to think about, well, what are we creating, okay? What is being created and what are we creating alongside as readers. Okay, so I've been thinking about this. Um, I mentioned that I did, I started a project in 2020. I wrote um, an article called My Beloved Community and I was wrapping my mind around what it was like to teach during the pandemic, but not just teach during the pandemic with all the changes, but teach students who were dealing with multiple marginalities, um, multiple pandemics, some would um, say or describe. And in that, I realized that I had to evoke a different level of care, a different level of ethic. I had to negotiate what it meant um, to be tired, what it meant to be, um, to love, thick, right? What was thick love in the context of the classroom for myself and for my students? What did it mean to consider not only the fact that the, the imminent death, um, threat of death or possible loss of loved ones was happening, but also to consider what it might mean to now be displaced or maybe now being without a job, right? You know, not so different from some of the, the situations within this novel. And so I used um, Beloved, particular scenes from Beloved, and I also drew from MLK's Beloved Communities, his principles, and as well as Bell Hooks, um, concept of love, right? All about love. And so I did that, but then when I wrote that, I felt like there was still more that I was trying to say, and I was trying to understand beyond the classroom. And um, I thought about my time in South Africa and what I was trying to process there when I was teaching through apartheid, not, well, the residuals of apartheid, where they had social unrest, and um, they were protesting and <laughs> it was all about language policies and injustices that, and promises that, that were not fulfilled um, as a result of the new constitution um, when apartheid was ended. Sounded very similar to what was happening in the US. And so I am thinking about what it means to create community um, in multiple spaces and places to have those rememories, right? Where uh, the place can be gone, you can be gone from that place, but that the imagination still holds it, still captures it, still process it. All right. So before I get into maybe defining that a little bit more, what I'm thinking about with beloved communities, I wanted us to kind of think together um, you know, if we consider that Morrison is possibly teaching us that community is essential um, to overcome oppression, if we, we would entertain that concept, I want to know what we think community is. Now, I'm trying something, you know, with Answer Garden with your technology, because I thought I was going to have handouts, but if you don't want to go here and populate that, that's perfectly fine. You can actually just respond and I can actually restate your response so that it's recorded. So how are we defining community? Class? <laughs> yes, sir. I think of the community as a living organism. Mm -hmm. It has a voice, the voice quite often changes. I'm not before it, I squeak, and then all of a sudden my voice changed and I became hoarse. And it has matured through the years, and that's what a community is. Mm -hmm. It grows. It's an organism, matures, mm -hmm. and on the go. So community is an organism that grows, it expands, it matures. Those are some really powerful terms. Somebody else. It could be a building. Mm -hmm. 
village. Okay. People. A village of people. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We're building our own community, right? In this conversation. So it's okay to tag along. So we have an organism that is growing and maturing and you have a village of people. Okay. Maybe we can think about if we build on this with this village of people, um, what maybe are some characteristics of this village of people? So intertwining of culture. So we have so we have um, some shared culture with rules and some um, you said institutions. Okay, all right. And so somebody else, I think I had, saw your hand. No, am I just doing that thing that the professor thing where I'm like. I saw your hands like, no, I wasn't. <laughs> uh, shared, sense shared sense of identity. Okay, okay. Over here. I was gonna say community is also a place that could be disrupted by natural forces or economic forces. Oh, you're trying to get into my stuff. Okay, so <laughs> that's good. All right, so communities, so not just what communities are, but what can happen to them. Miami. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Interstate, right through. Right through. Mm. Smashed. Smashed. Okay. So you have disruptions. So community is, while it's an organism, right? And it can be a village of people. And we have these shared cultures and we have these shared identities and we have these rules that we govern ourselves. Those rules are not necessarily impermeable. You can have a highway run right through it. Okay. You can have. Um, a new law <laughs> that can overturn those shared identities or those shared rules or belief systems, yes? So Morrison is teaching us while we need community, at the same time, it's not impermeable. It's not without um, obstruction. Now, what is obstructed? What would drive um, something to disrupt a community? Um, why would you have a highway through Overton? What is what what is the thing we need to name? Okay, so it can be growth. Okay, okay. Now we're gonna come back to this at the end because I have another part. Um, I have another part that to this. I have like three stages that I want to go through, okay? But I like what you're saying. But let's talk about what Morrison might be telling us or what she has been telling us. Let's go back. Let me, I have my nice little clicker. I will click. Let's go back. She's disrupting us, right? What does she say she's disrupting us? She wants us to be kidnapped just like the, the population in this, this novel has been kidnapped. What is this kidnapping? Easy answer, I promise you. Think American history. Okay, okay, okay. Slavery, very good, very good. <laughs> it's like, no, can't be that. It can't be slavery, absolutely. But you know what happens? You know what happens? When we are in our, um, we go to these meetings, right? You know, to improve our communities. We go um, and we try to do coalition building. You know, we forget the obvious <laughs> things often. It, it, it misses us, it's in our face. It's like, I don't know why that community no longer exists. I don't know why we have a highway that's driving. Yes, we want growth, but there are also other motivations, yes? You said it, I didn't. Okay. <laughs> Smoky Hollow, right here, right downtown. You can go right to, and, and it's very nice. You know, we do things like we commemorate them, and I, I respect the work. I've, I've worked with people who have worked with that museum. Um, I know a lot about that history. I was there when Blueprint was, you know, working on it. Um, and it, it is a really great thing to see it unfold. But then it also should make us think <laughs> about what happens, what, what's at stake, and why 
um, why we are doing this. Why do we have to commemorate it? Why do we have a house that has to commemorate where a community was? Yes, sir. Well, you listen, you want the mic? <laughs> that was it. You, you, you can have, um, there is a detachment, there is a, a convenient disconnection from the past when you're able to commemorate it, but actually say you have no parts of it. One thing I like about Beloved is that um, Morrison shows us by the ways in which we aren't really able to tell what's what's tangible, what's material versus what's spirit, what is happening versus what's in the imagination. Is the imagination something we can trust? But we're forced to trust it, right? Because that's where we get the bulk of the narrative because we have to create it. We have to create this space um, that no one documented, right? This, this is not um, the documented era um, or the era of documentation, the era of information, especially recognizing Black people as humans, right? And so that's a, a really significant, um, I read somewhere they mentioned it as like a coming of age for these people. And I hadn't considered it like that, um, you know, thinking of Setha as, um, and even as baby Suggs, as, as going through a coming of age, her own journey to becoming a woman, right? not becoming a woman in the sense of any of her functions. She's mothered, she's cared for community. She's done all the things that we would recognize as actually a leader, a woman, you know, a, a woman of the cloth even. But there was still that, um, the elusive concept of freedom that would not permit them to recognize self they had to kind of construct their own identities of their own sense of self, right? And so they're in this process of constructing those identities. Um, and so I was gonna say something else and I lost my train of thought. It'll come back, <laughs> it'll come back. But I got excited about what you said with the, oh yes, the disconnection with the, the past. And so that convenience of being able to have clean hands and what what I liken like, and it's the second part, I see the second or third part of the book where you see um, uh, Setha and um, Beloved, their faces, they, they're starting to, it's kind of like the writing is so blurred, you lose sense of whose face is what, who is talking to whom, right? You lose sense of that because they are one. There's a lot of references like, oh, she looks like this. She has my face, she has my face. So there's this connection to the past that we see that is, is not always pretty, right? The fact that they are connected to Setha who has done this act, right? Has committed a fantasy, which is her version of thick love, right? Um, that is where they are tracing. They're keeping records, good and bad. Morrison is, is juxtaposing good and bad, but you don't see that same claim to history with the white characters. They do not claim <laughs> they will inherit the land. They will inherit the cattle. They will inherit the slaves. They will not inherit the legacy of slavery. The, the, the trauma inflicted. Even when they watch um, Setha kill her baby, right? That was the only thing Setha said she could do to stop them. There was nothing else she could do to stop them, to make them stop in their tracks, to even correct behavior, than to do something so heinous in their eyes, right? But they did not see themselves as necessarily the cause of it. Um, Toni Morrison does. <laughs> she says as much. She doesn't leave much to mystery there or to surprise or to our um, imagination. She actually outlines it. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, so we are defining community, okay? Now I wanna talk about what I'm thinking about when it comes to the love of community. Like I said, I started with something and I was, it was kind of loosely defined as, you know, these things that were connected to what I'm doing with my students in the classroom, 
you know, and I don't even imagine that I am unique in doing these things because it's ingrained in the village. Um, <laughs> um, as, as this student said, you know, when we define our community, we have village, we have shared um, value systems. So I'm not presenting it as if I have um, the cutting edge approach, but I'm trying to understand how do you do this on purpose? How do you design or go back and walk back through what you are doing to actually create this space of love and define it and, and beyond the um, plastic version of love where we might say, oh, love makes me feel good and that's where we end. Um, love may actually have you do some things, some hard things as um, Seth describes it. I, I had to do the hard thing, right? Okay, and so I, my definition is here um, and I would kind of extend it. I see this kind of as a continuum, as an ongoing, um, even as the community is an organism, it continues to mature. Like you said, I'm thinking about it as continuously growing, depending on um, the participants, how they're engaging it. And I say that I wanted to provide examples. I'm completely off my notes now, but that's okay. <laughs> um, what I want to share with you is, ooh, not that. Okay. This is an excerpt from Beloved that I feel like describes or kind of gives me something to hang my hat on when I say this. Um, she says, White people believe that whatever the manners under every dark skin was a jungle. The more colored people spent their strength trying to convince them how gentle they were, how clever and loving, how human, the more they used themselves up to persuade whites of something Negroes believe could not be, um, could not be questioned, the deeper and the more tangled, excuse me, the jungle grew inside. But it wasn't the jungle blacks brought with them to this place for, uh, from the other livable place. Uh, the construction of barbarism about blackness is a part of the construction of whiteness. And so what I mean there is that Morrison, even in her nonfiction describes how, um, how one is not existent without the other. They both are the idea or concept of race. And I feel like our audience actually is already aware of this. <laughs> So I am preaching to the choir, but this construction of these identities were co-created uh, co in, well, not co-created, but created for the, the purpose of slavery was created to actually promote and justify, right? It's endurance, right? You have to actually come up with the rules, <laughs> as you said, to justify why this is actually happening, right? And so, what she's saying here is that it did not come, even though the, the myth or the acts or, you know, the future slave law, the reason for these laws, actual tangible documents, laws, legal system, design, what were designed was to make sure that we are, as a nation, thinking of these bodies, these people, these, these community members as barbaric, as needing extra hard discipline, not deserving of love, right? Not deserving of acceptance or embrace, right? So that's what she's saying, but there is an aftermath. There is a side effect to that for the white people as she will, you know, she says a little later, it was the jungle white folks planted in them and it grew, it spread in, through and after life i.e. beloved, it spread until it invaded the whites who had made it, right? So it was not, they were not left untouched, right? So nobody was unaffected. And it made me think about what it means to be in community and what it doesn't mean to be in community. Um, community does not mean proximity. That's not the same thing. So I can be near you, but not be in community with you. So if we're talking about our definitions that we co-created, right? Um, you have to have that those shared values. You have to have those shared identities, but it, it, at some point there will be some disruption and those that you have to pay attention to how race and racism 
especially constructed in the US, has always been the highway that would drive through communities, right? Especially Black communities. The, the fact that Paul D found it dangerous to love too much, to hope too much, he wasn't the only one. The community, the Black community that she should have, um, that Baby Suggs and, and Setha should have been embraced by, they could not afford the luxury of joy or exuberance, right? It was too costly because, you know, the novel always talks about the whiteness around them, whether it be white snow or, you know, white fabric, it's, it's all around them. They, they can't really escape it. And so it became the ominous presence that Baby Suggs sensed when she started to feel too proud, right? When she actually was just embracing, she was just actually doing what any one of us would do. You have family coming home, and we're just gonna oversimplify slavery for just a second. <laughs> they're coming, they're coming home for the holiday. They've been away. I don't know. Pick, pick something that's uh, traumatic for us. Like maybe they've been to war. Maybe they've been um, oh, pandemic. They have. They were in the hospital, and now they actually get to come home. And it's like, oh my goodness, you know, I'm excited. I'm, I'm ecstatic. I want to celebrate. Um, you have this new baby. You, and, and think about baby sons now. Her son sold his life, right? He bartered his life for hers. And that was the last child she had. So her, her identity or how she constructed, or wanted to construct her identity as a mother, it was not even allowed for her in her latter years, right? So here she gets another chance with her grandchildren. She gets to see them, embrace it, and she opens it to the community, shared ideas, shared values. She wants to bring them in, and then she feels the presence, and she ended up talking about how she was distracted by the, the town gossip, like, you know, of her exuberance, right? And I think we know about people who do that. We live in a, a big town, right? We know <laughs> if, if some a conversation gets out, you know, and it kind of spreads in a particular community, you can kind of tell like, oh, you know, people give you a nice kind of smile, but it, it's a loaded smile. It's, it, it carries another message. Am I the only one? Okay, all right. I was like, maybe I'm reading it wrong. Okay. Um, <laughs> But you, we know we can identify that. And Morrison is doing that on purpose. She knows we can identify with that. She knows we can, can get caught up in those stories because we have similar stories. We've, been, we've heard stories passed down um, about other people, you know, it's like, did you hear about little Johnny? You know, whether it's a good, good news or bad news. My mom actually would gossip about good news. But did you hear that, you know, he won an award, like, why are we whispering? Okay. <laughs> but okay, you know, it's it's a part of community. It's a it's it's an unspoken rule, you know, that you pass it through oral tradition, right? You know, and so you have that going on, and and baby sis is distracted by it, you know, and she is overwhelmed by and not able to be on guard, right? In fact, what broke her heart, she talks about you know, those boundaries. She could not keep the white folks from crossing her boundaries, even though she had her home, right, that was purchased for her. It's still, the stairs were still white. <laughs> so she wanted color. Before she left, she wanted the freedom of color, to see color, right? So thinking about this, um, let's see what so we think about this and we see that even in um, these communities, I'm thinking about um, how it's not just um, something that a black woman needs to do for her black students, okay? This is something that we all should be doing because it's all of our history, right? So we all should be thinking about ways in which um, the impact of this um, systemic oppression has tri uh, trickle down effect. How is it trickling down into spaces that I occupy? Maybe even how am I complicit? You know, how is my ignorance of it, regardless of race, how is my ignorance of it, my lack of understanding of the nuances? Because see, Morrison critiques the Black community as well, right? There is um, a moment where um, Stamp paid 
you know, he actually visits Ella and he's talking to Ella and, um, and it's later on the, the text. So he's already feeling guilty for, I won't tell it all for everybody who's going <laughs> to read it. Um, but he's feeling guilty about how he handled or mishandled Setha and um, Paul D. And so he is trying to make things right. And he's trying to figure out how, because that's a part of his identity. He has constructed his identity about building, you know, bridges um, um, in the Black community, uh, building and extending life and, and community. And something he said has ended community. It has stopped it, right? And it has stopped the promise or the hope or the expectation for um, a particular community that he loved, right? He cared about them in a, in a unique way. And so when he's talking to Ella, he's actually critiquing her for her lack of community with Setha. So even though Setha made her choice, right? And she defined love on her own terms, right? I probably should go to my next slide. Okay. She defines love on her own terms. And um, in doing so, it caused her to be excommunicated. And it caused the joy that was once there that was thick, that was exuberant to die, okay? And Stampede critiques Ella for it. And it was uh, in regards to Stampede. And she was, and Ella was like, well, I know where Stampede is. Or, uh, I know where uh, Paul D is. Paul D had left on uh, 124 at this point. And Stampede didn't know where he was. And he made it his business to know where everybody was. Everybody Black knew where, all right, he knew where everybody Black was because he was a part of the Underground Railroad, right? He was, you know, a spy, you know, he went through all these titles. He, he took pride in that ownership, right? And being able to create freedom in his sense. But he did not bother to look for Paul D because he knew he was the reason why he was not he was not um, enjoying his life right so anyway he goes and <laughs> and he tells her that it was not for Paul D to ask for help Paul D did not receive help from Ella because Ella felt like Paul D should have asked her I know I'm not the only one who's kind of gotten into um, standoffs with people. Uh, it's like, well, they didn't ask for help. It's like, but you knew they needed help. Yes? Yeah, we know about that, right? Um, and so it, again, another very human, personable, across the board, um, relational thing here that's happening with people who were not considered to be human. So Morrison is forcing us to recognize their humanity in another way. And so what I love about that exchange is that Stampede is like, that because he was a part of our community, he shared culture, he shared that, that was enough. If you saw him out, at, down and out, without, that was your call to action, that he should not be without. If you knew, you should have done something, right? So anyway, I, I think that, my, one of my lessons that I'm, I'm taking from this is that um, what was stated here, freedom from the oppressed, uh, for the oppressed must be defined by the oppressed. And that is a lesson that school teacher deliberately is trying to teach 6-0, right? <laughs> he deliberately tells him that they are, is telling him, um, and Morrison tells us outrightly, that that is not um, a lesson or um, a lesson that you can teach me because I define the terms. It's on my terms, right? And so every character we see, they're trying to find their own way. And I'm thinking through what that might look like. Um, again, applied. If we were to extrapolate that from the text and kind of think about our communities where we share values, where, where we have these living organisms that we want to mature. You know, we want them to mature and go beyond and be as impermeable as they can be, right? You know, to avoid um, the disruptive thread of um, slavery and um, racism, right? And the legacy of slavery. So 
I, I, I think we need to think about how um, we're defining terms, right? And how that can actually, how we are co-creating co and making room for people to define their own terms. So I asked this question, um, I'm thinking about this quote, when Setha locked the door, the women inside were free at last to be what they liked, see what they say, uh, see what they, sorry, <laughs> whatever they saw and say whatever was on their minds, okay? So why do you think Morrison writes this at this time? How might this be an expression of the oppressed defining their own freedom, their own liberation? Yes, I, I think that's a really great response, especially given the context of this section. This is, and, and oppression, um, Stampede is the one on the outside in this scene, right? Stampede actually talks about, or at least we get a sense of how he is always free. That was the price that was paid. If he got them free, he had free access. He can go in and out of their homes as he pleased. There was nowhere where he had to stutter or stop. But this was different. And it was a, a, a late rev revelation, 18 years <laughs> in the making. But somehow, Setha came to herself and said, I'm going to lock this door. Because at, at some point, she needed to have a barrier, right? There was something that blocked her. Somebody else, any other thoughts about that? Okay. Okay. And I think that's still that's a good educated guess, actually. Um, I, I think that there may be a sense of her revelation, right? Because she's actually bonding with Beloved in this moment and Denver. I, I was looking at it as like, she gets another chance to be the mom that she didn't get a chance to be um, because of the, the, the highway, <laughs> right? Or the hat in that situation, the hat that um, school teacher wore. When she saw the hat, it disrupted everything. And she had to make the decision quick, quick, right? There, there, was, there was that quick, quick. She didn't get a chance to think about what was the best thing. She just knew that she said she wanted to keep her children for what she knew was worse. That wasn't her business to know what was, what was better than that, what, 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 a different way. She had to avoid what she knew was the worst thing. And that's what she called thick love. And so she gives that thick love. And I feel like there is this reinforcement of that thick love in that space. Um, and she was allowed to have that um, with her door locked. She couldn't have that with Stampede or anyone else um, coming in and not recognizing her need for her identity to be constructed as a mother, right? Um, and her love to be validated um, is what I'm thinking. Oh, there are chats. Oh. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Okay. Okay, okay, fantastic. I hope I've been doing that. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, um, uh, any other comments? No, no responses from the people in the chat? Um, there were some earlier, the, uh, the community Oh. Okay, okay. Anything different from what we've already said? <clears throat> yeah. Oh, 
Okay, now the love regardless, I think that really ties in to what we're talking about with, with Beloved because what I think, I, I don't have it here as one of the lessons just because of the sake of time, but one of the lessons that I, I'm taking from this is the love, um, that thick love is the love regardless, that set the deserved love from the community despite what they thought about her choices. I think that's a really big point, especially if we're going to take from this any kind of principles for how we would apply it into, you know, our communities or how we will be reflective on our policies or any, any kind of forward moving, right, um, movement. We need to think about, okay, well, where are we possibly isolating communities or groups of people because they are not defining the terms the way we would? they are not loving in the ways that we would expect them to love, okay? Um, you know, there are, of course, we can grow and mature um, and we can expand our concept of community. But again, we, we need to always be in conversation with those um, who are directly affected and impacted, right? Not to say that we have one solitary view about a particular thing, or you could ever get there, but you can share, you can find your points of adherence. You can find your points where you will actually agree and align, yes? So at least give it, give it a chance, because what we see, excuse me, what we see in um, Beloved, especially in the end, when the community finally, um, when Denver steps out and she's the one that's taking on to the next place, right? She steps out, she's like finding her freedom and her voice and she speaks up, you know, which I actually cringed when I, I read it again because I thought about how often I got in trouble for, <laughs> for talking about anything that happened in the house, you know, even if it was just, you know, well, um, like if, I'm not gonna put my mom a blast, but, <laughs> but, um, if, if something happened where, you know, an aunt or uncle, you know, maybe went to a party or something like that. I didn't see any discretion needed, you know? And so if somebody asked, I was like, oh yeah, they went to the party and I would get the look and then the talk. So <laughs> like, it's like, you know, what happens in this house stays in this house, right? You know, for, for good or for ill. That's, that was what I was taught. And I think about that in the sense of Denver and how courageous she had to be to speak up. <laughs> and to share their needs, you know, and to share the conditions of her mother, you know, in that moment where her mother really needed community, but would not ask for it at all because community left her one time, no need to expect it from them again, right? And so when they actually come and they corral themselves and they, you know, they actually um, get rid of, and I say get rid of with air quotes because beloved, Although she goes and breaks apart, right? She's fragmented. There, there's still some kind of um, nod towards her coming back at the end, right? You know, not as a whole thing, but this is that rememory, the call to the thing, the place, even though the, the place or the material trauma or site of trauma is gone, it does not mean that that the, the mark on the mind has left, right? So, let me see, okay, because I am almost out of time. Okay, <laughs> um, so then I said this point earlier, but I just kind of wanted to end with this to say that this history is not um, one group's history. Um, the explanation, the, the deep thinking that comes with understanding this text, other text, um, by African uh, American authors, other authors, not just <laughs> black people, but uniquely in this country, the foundation of our country is rooted on these relationships. And it's important that we all advocate for the learning and the deep thinking about it, um, that we support any efforts, right? We educate young, we don't wait until they're much older because by then it's some of those ideas that need to be tweaked or need to be um, 
matured, <laughs> may have calcified. <laughs> and so we need to maybe challenge those ideas and make sure that we're bringing and expanding these conversations, um, engaging these conversations as often as we can. Um, so I asked a few more questions or a couple more questions. Where are the beloved communities in your city, right? Where, where do we have them that are local? Okay, and how are we engaging them? So I'll end there with those questions. Is this a direct question about Tallahassee? Yes, yeah, but I know there are people on um, online who are not in Tallahassee. Yeah. So I just said your city. Well, this is an odd answer, Trader Joe's. Trader Joe's, talk There's to me. There's an open community in there. Mm -hmm. People are going to get good food, nutritious, it's not expensive. The employees that work there represent all race, creeds, mm -hmm. colors, mm -hmm. ideas. And so every time I walk in there, I feel like I'm walking into a community. Now, I, I do agree that it is a community. Um, I'm wondering how does it tie into the history of slavery in this, this country? Like maybe how, how would you define that? Or how are you seeing it that way? Or maybe you just thought of community. I just thought of community. <laughs> <laughs> and that's fine because I'm asking you deep questions very quickly. So I understand that. Yes. Can I give a response that I would say that what Trader Joe's is? Please. So it kind of looks like what maybe Tallahassee Market, a futuristic view of what it should turn to be. Okay. So I will, I will restate it for the sake of our viewers online. So you're saying that Trader Joe's would represent a, um, an example of a beloved community um, because it is, a, um, it, it is a representation of what could have been um, in this city. If, 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 for example, Trader Joe's kind of prides itself on not only having community, but highlighting local landmarks and Mm -hmm. or produce in certain places, wines in certain places. They also have very uh, uh, progressive views on how to treat their staff, on mm -hmm. social benefits and uh, taking time off and even like cultural mm. awareness. Um, so they're very forward thinking and, and even more, more than just the place to get some other stuff. Okay. Yeah. So it so it's not just um, um, good on the on the, the pocket, right? Easy on the pocket, but it also um, yes. Okay. Oh. So it's an ecosystem. I'm trying to say it like you said it. But it was so beautiful and elegant. Um, the ecosystem of Help me out. Of community. Of community. And the financial okay, so financial, but you also said representation of um, of the diverse population, members of the population, where they're not only their products are not only so like you had baby Suggs in the text, who's a, a um, an expert cobbler, okay, among other things. But you know, and I love the play on cobbler and cobbler because she, you know, could cook, she could throw down. But she also was good with her hands in an in, in industrial way for shoes, right? But she was not treated with the same equity that you would maybe see at a, at a Trader Joe's. Interesting, okay, I hadn't even considered that. Okay, all right, thank you. That, that was a really cool, yeah, that's a cool idea. Anybody? Everything I was yeah, you were, you were like, I was going there. I love it. This is like exactly like, Exactly how the class works. Exactly. <laughs> yes. I'm glad you said that. Oh no. 
Because I'm not going to remember all of this. <laughs> They won't, they won't hear it on that one, so I'll take that out. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay, I was saying, I'm thinking about just this question, and what I'm going to say to you is real loaded, and I'm probably going to back into it in a way. But I'm thinking about the beloved community, the how, we're thinking about residential, right? I'm in Bond, right on Saxon Street, then the community of FAMU, which is the academy, as Dr. Walker would call it, right? She would say, this is the academy, what happens in the community. We should, we are prepared a certain way in the academy. And how those two communities, while sharing a lot of the same history, um, tend to, um, I can see residents who may not have attended maybe while they have pride in it or were not educated, they feel this separateness from that community, the back even being in the back door or the shadow of the community. So I'm thinking about all of that juxtaposition when I think a little bit about the love and how you see some of that, you know, difference from what was happening in the house or what's happening in the community and how all of those things were kind of come together. So just okay. um, you said something interesting about the back door and uh, it made me think about maybe subs. That's a volume, so they'll be able to hear anything. Oh, the mic now. Yep. I said yeah. I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I think about Baby Suggs and her deliberate redesign of Wonder. She purposely closed the back door. Um, I don't know if those of you ready remember why. Because what I was talking about as a cobbler, she could not enter the home. She had to go to the back door. With her expert shoe, right? Shoe design expert. They want the shoes here, and I want them now. And you're the only one, you're the best one to do it. She walked with a lift, but he's a kick down. But she could stand for, for this position. She, she could actually do this really well, but she was not recognized that way. But in 124, this was a sacred space. She designed it in a way. And I mean, you know, that is something that I might even think about when I think about the design of the local communities, thinking about how it requires a, a a reimagining of those spaces. Okay. Um, reimagining of those spaces um, in a way that um, is is uplifting, that will allow or afford the people the opportunity to see value in themselves. She closed off that back door because she didn't want anybody to have. They have to go through her. You come into one twenty four. You got to go through. Okay. Her, so you you through it. Okay. The fact that she didn't put a kitchen outside again, that was it was a novel idea that, that we all do now. It's like, oh, yes, I'm redesigning my kitchen, and, and you're fancy if you're putting your kitchen um, equipment out so outdoors, right? You got a lot of money if you got an outdoor patio with a, a, a grill and you know the whole setup, the whole shebang. But it was a little different, and there was a reason why it was a little different. And so they mocked her for something that now we are celebrating. We have absorbed into American culture. It's a part of the common way of doing things. Right, Morrison, she, she's a, she's a, whew, she's a tough act to follow, right? Uh -huh. um, but at the same time, what I appreciated about Morrison is that she was for the village. She wrote for the village. So she made sure that she elevated conversations that she thought were missing from the text that were missing, but they were vital. They were the missing pieces and the pages that we needed for our country to do the right thing, to right some wrongs, right? Um, I'm going to stop talking now and let you talk a little bit more. Any questions for me? <clears throat> this is uh, about halfway through. This is unlike anything I've ever read before. I was keep wanting the narrator to help me out. Um, <laughs> uh, so right off the bat, like that first thing you put up. I was going to put it back up. <laughs> is, is, could you, I don't want you to do any spoilers, for whatever, <laughs> but can you uh, list the names of the people, persons, from the beginning through to about the halfway point. Oh, 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 that's a tall order. <laughs> oh, um, I... so why is she named Baby Sucks? I mean, that, and there's 
is a dead baby right off the bat. But, What's going yeah, on? well, you got to stick around because more is a tenor. You got to hang in there. Hang in there. It, it's, a, it's a tough first time around, I can tell you. I'm, but I will tell you what I tell my students, what I tell them when they're trying to read a Shakespearean play, and they're trying to track all of these, these people, who are they, who the, who's the father, who's the son, well, wait, we go ahead and we, try, we create a little grid, and we write down, we're like, okay, in this section, this act, we know these people, these are the characters, right? So maybe you have read some other things that are similar to it, it's just the, the, the content She's making you apply it in a sense you've never had to. We never had to be critical about something like this before. We, we, we didn't have to be curious, I should even say, about why names were maybe different from what we would recognize as regular or normal names, right? I have, I, I, I talked to one of my, my older cousins last night and um, I hope he, not watching. I'm going to say anyway. <laughs> um, so he has a, we have a family nickname for him um, that he would obliterate you if you called him that. Um, Big brother. It's a marker of our family community, right? But there's a story behind that. I have an aunt. I go, I've always known her from childhood on up, Auntie KK. Found out the story behind it was that when she was little, they used to, she used to like to eat cake. So they would be like, oh, she like cake cake. And you know, when you start simplifying, that's something we do with English. We simplify and we simplify so it's easy and portable. Cake cake. Cake cake. Who has time to slow down and say, oh, cake cake. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cake. Right? Function. The, Morrison is giving you a, an insider's view in that kind of that may be detached from something that you recognize. Hang in there. It's going to be worth it. I would use the pair of lovers with song of song. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. See, now I have, okay, I didn't even tell you the story. I was going to tell you in the beginning because I have like 50 different ways I was going to start this talk. One of them was going to be the first, my first introduction to Morrison was Song of Solomon. I was 17 and nosy. My aunt had a bookshelf of Black authors. And I was like, well, what is this about? And then I saw something about flying people. And I had heard enough of African folklore to know about the Igbo people, right? You know, and, but I didn't know it. it I didn't know it like that. I just, we had like storytelling reels, you know, that kind of thing. And I continue to read. I, I have not, and I actually wanted to. I know there are other people in the room in the back who could probably give you a little more. <laughs> Some of my colleagues are here who could actually give you a better response because I, I just haven't read it in a long time. So it wouldn't be fair, but maybe you could tell me what you're thinking just from what you heard, like maybe some of the parallels. I don't know. Obviously, the racist. Oh, I mean, yeah. And community, right? Community is huge in Song of Solomon. Yeah, well, and lineage, right? You know. Yeah, family. 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 Yeah. Very hard. Very hard. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, uh, again, Morrison is letting us understand that rigor is not. Um, relegated to only one kind of text. We have um, a, assigned rigor and um, value to the American great text, the, the, the canonized text, right? She talks about this in her lectures all the time, you know? Uh, or she has talked about that. <laughs> yes. Have you read the short story I've taught it before. I have. That's quite it is. It is. <laughs> but it's, uh, yeah. Yeah. So um, I, I think what you're picking up is a common thread in Morrison's approach to the writing and the work that she is aiming to do, right? With her, her literary work, she is trying to get us to recognize 
um, to tilt and to see another gaze, another perspective where we are not centering um, uh, the whiteness that has been constructed as a result of slavery, right? These identities. There is an interiority that you, you don't have access to um, just by being neighbors with a black person or um, having close proximity, like I said. It does not mean you have to be Nope. Nope. Yeah. Why is the love so dangerous? Yeah, why is it being censored not, not being yeah. taught at home and so over? That's what the thing's the trash yeah. Oh, why is it being censored? Well, you can uh, <laughs> you can um accept what you've been told about <laughs> why it's been censored because of the explicit nature. Um, of the real atrocities of slavery, right? Um, but then you can also <laughs> look at our track record. Um, that we can think back to slavery and think about why there are certain, um, Morrison talks about the names, for instance. We have Paul A, Paul, Paul D. You have, and when they leave, when they try to find their ancestors, now, I wish, I don't know, I didn't see a lot of you there Saturday, but it was a great session um, doing the genealogy search. You learned so much um, about how challenging it is during these different periods. It, the difference between 10 years, um, 1870 versus 1880, what you can find out about enslaved people. You can find out maybe where they lived and the name that they were given, they were given but you will not necessarily find out their relationships because we're not human. Why would they have relationships? So that question about why is it dangerous? Um, I, I feel like there's so many different ways to look at that. It's dangerous um, because I would say when you're creating a lot of communities, going back to one of the lessons, when you're empowering people to define their own freedom, um, that's dangerous. That can be lethal. When you start to criticize or analyze um, power structures that have not served with integrity, that can be dangerous to some, right? You think about how they start to analyze the good slave masters over the past. That happens in the living. Hang in there. You'll see. They'll start. Morrison explains it a little bit. <laughs> and, and you'll see that they kind of come to the conclusion that this construction of whiteness, this white identity, is all dangerous, which is a dangerous story to tell. Right. When you, if, yeah. yeah. That's right. <laughs> okay, talk about. In time, in time of lives, I didn't mean talking about the construct of what we live in, why the love is excessive, and why it's sensitive, and all of these things. That the internalized identity that we've accepted, I mean, we as African American people, people want us to the dominant constructs, wants us to stay in that mindset. I, I think about this often as a community advocate, right, and trying to have community change. Right. And then empower people to recognize their own voice and the answers to their own situations, right? We're used to government or the dominant. Oh, oh. Oh, okay, I thought I was a little bit strong. I, I boosted you. Know, oh, no. Okay. Um, we're used to, I would say, the dominant construct telling us what to feel, how to do it, process it. All of these things. Therefore, as I'm studying, if I, if I were ever to go and study anything higher, I, I, I'm interested in how the internalized identity show up and how why I can go to any city in America and find where all the black neighborhoods are. Mm -hmm. I can see it so I, I can recognize it as soon as I get there, mm -hmm. right? And and why is that? And, and so all of this, I'm thinking about all of these things that I have not read Tony Morrison since now in a long time, to college, because I was 
attention class. Everybody gets full marks. <laughs> yeah, no, no, full marks, full marks. Top of class, every one of you. Thank you so much for engaging um, and for the opportunity to share my ideas today. So I'm going to say um, I have closing remarks. Thank you so much, Dr. Dr. K, for sharing your insight with us about Tony Morrison and Beloved. I would like to invite all of you to our um, Tony Morrison, The Pieces I Am award-winning documentary here on the 24th. I guess it'll be in this room. It's the 24th. Is that next? That's this week? Yeah, yeah. that's a couple of days. Right? So come on back. Um, you can find more information about this and any other events that we have related to the NEA degree on our website. Um, we are going to be discussing Tony Morrison and Beloved throughout the rest of this month as well as March. So and we've got some wonderful other events coming up um, with the Black Archives and the State Library as well. So please join us. Thank you very much for the very lively conversation. I love that conversation. I love that you brought in conversation because that's important. And uh, have a lovely evening. And please get some of these sandwiches. That oh, yeah. All right, y'all have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yes. If you, uh, the Park Avenue doors are still open. We usually close them at six. So if you parked on the Park Avenue side, the doors are still open. You don't have to go all the way around.